And uh, of course, the scriptures are on the screen behind me, and I trust that you're ready for the word. We also welcome our internet audience this morning, whether people are watching our live stream or whether you will uh, link into the service at a later stage. Welcome. We trust that the word will bless you as well. All right, so we are still uh, on our journey. Uh, celebrating, as we've said, 30 years uh, since the planting of this church here called Victory Christian Center. And uh, the title of this series of messages is Living a Life of Faith and Victory. And we did say that as part of our celebration, uh, we have uh, determined that we will um, revisit some of the key truths that we have preached from day one, and I mean day one, uh, and uh, some of these wonderful truths that have helped to build the house and helped to build the people that call victory their spiritual home. I want to quickly recap on where we've been last week and what we talked about before we uh, move on from there. But you will recall that we spoke about Sarah's faith last week from Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 11. And it says, By faith Sarah herself also received strength to conceive seed, and she bore a child when she was past the age because she judged him faithful who had promised. And when the Bible says by faith, in fact, all the way through the chapter 11 of the book of Hebrews, it says by faith this one did this. By faith that one did that. By faith really means four things. Number one, it means to hear what the Word of God says. Number two, it means to believe what the Word of God says. Number three, it means to confess with your mouth what the Word of God says. And number four, it means to do what the Word of God says. And friend, can I really encourage you in those four areas? If you leave any one of those four areas out, you're not truly and not properly walking by faith. That's why we break these things down. You know, my greatest joy is to, get, uh, to help people to get into a, a faith walk and to live a life by faith because that's what God wants us to do. And of course, we said that Sarah heard the word of God. She heard the promise uh, that God gave her and, and, and uh, her husband Abraham. Um, and uh, we said that she believed it in her heart. Uh, she confessed it with her mouth and then she acted upon it, came together with Abraham and they conceived the boy, and of course the rest is history. So this morning, I would like to continue on from there, and I would like to speak to you about the confession or declaration of faith. So out of those four areas that we've covered so far, is to hear, to believe, to speak, and to do. I want to major on the third aspect of it, um, and that is the whole area of the confession of the Word of God or the declaration of the Word of God or the proclamation of the Word of God in your life. So I'm reading from Mark chapter 11, verse 12 through to verse 14. It says, The next day when they come out of Bethany, Jesus was hungry. And seeing from afar off a fig tree having leaves, he went to see if perhaps he would find something on it. When he came to it, he found nothing but leaves, for it was not the season for figs. Um, verse 14, In response, Jesus said to it, Let no one eat fruit from you ever again, and his disciples heard it. Now, we have a story here recorded for us where Jesus was in Jerusalem doing what he did, preaching and visiting the temple and, you know, in one instance, overthrowing the table of the money changers, healing people and all of that stuff. And then uh, in the evening, they went out to Bethany, which was within walking distance, stayed the night there and went back into Jerusalem the following day. And right here, We've got a situation where they come from Bethany. They're now back en route into Jerusalem. Um, and um, I don't know what the story is uh, and whether they didn't have breakfast or whether they had breakfast and Jesus is now, it's morning tea time, I don't know. But anyway, it would appear that Jesus was hungry. So he went over to a fig tree and he was hoping to find some fruit on it, uh, and, uh, but there was none. Uh, there was only leaves on there. And, uh, and Jesus began to speak to this fig tree, and he made a faith declaration. He made a faith confession over it, or if you like, against it. Um, 
And uh, really, somebody said once, oh, Jesus went over there, and then when he couldn't find any fix, Jesus got angry. Well, no, Jesus didn't get angry. It wasn't an anger issue. This is a faith lesson to his disciples that are with him. Uh, he wanted to teach them how faith works. Um, and so he began to speak to this fig tree, uh, and he made a faith declaration against it, which caused it to dry up from its roots within the space of about 24 hours. Now, somebody said once, I was like, well, I've tried that, and Nothing happened, not in 24 hours, not in 24 days, not in 24 months or 24 years. And so, well, we need to realize that Jesus had a highly developed faith. People say, oh, Jesus did that because he's God and he was able to do that. No, no, Jesus didn't operate as God. He was God in human form, but he didn't operate as God. He operated as a man anointed with the Holy Spirit. Uh, and very shortly, uh, when Jesus gives us the explanation about what just took place, we will find out that everybody can make this work. All right? Whoever wants to step into that, into a faith walk, everybody can make this work for themselves. All right? And so, uh, right there, Jesus spoke to the fig tree, and he said, Let no one eat fruit from you ever again. Jesus wasn't vague about it. He wasn't hazy about it. He made a very clear statement. Uh, when you and I walk by faith and we begin to speak faith, it's good to not be hazy and unclear, um, but that we're very clear and very precise, that we speak the end result uh, uh, very precisely over situations and over circumstances. Now, Mark eleven twenty. Uh, it says, in the morning as they passed by, they saw the fig tree dried up from the roots. Now, let me explain again. Um, one morning, they're going into Jerusalem from Bethany on the way. Jesus speaks to the fig tree. They carry on. Um, Jesus did what he did uh, in Jerusalem. In the evening, they come back out again. They go back to Bethany, stay the night. And the next morning, they go back in again. And this is now verse 20. All right. They're now uh, 24 hours approximately later from the time that Jesus made that faith statement. Uh, it says that as they passed by, they saw the fig tree dried up from the roots. And Peter, remembering, said to him, Rabbi, look, the fig tree which you cursed has withered away. Now, sometimes... Uh, uh, people don't realize, but, you know, Jesus didn't use the word curse. He just spoke uh, a, a, a negative result over this uh, fig tree, um, and it was for all intents and purposes a curse, even though he didn't use the word, word curse. Now you can speak negatively over your life and not realize that you're actually cursing your own life. You can speak negatively over your family and not realize that you're actually cursing your family with the words of your own mouth. Friends, let me tell you, the devil is not our biggest problem. A loose mouth is our biggest problem. Because with it, we can bless or curse. We can do so consciously or we can do so ignorantly. But whatever it is, words of our mouth are very, very powerful. It's a little bit like, you know, it's a little bit like... Uh, you know, it's a little bit like a gun, you know, like a, a firearm is a very powerful thing to be able to achieve certain things. But each time when you speak words, it's like you're putting a bullet into the barrel and you're shooting this thing. And, uh, and, and this thing will either work against you or it'll work for you. All right. It'll either defeat your enemies or it will defeat you based on the words of your own mouth. Yes. So here in verse 14, it describes the declaration of faith. The Bible says that Jesus spoke to it and his disciples heard it. So Jesus wasn't mumbling. He wasn't kind of whispering under his breath, as it were. But Jesus made a very loud and a very clear faith statement, a very clear uh, faith command, if you like, a declaration. His disciples heard it. So that's what we have here. We've got this declaration of faith. Then verse 20 and verse 21 speaks about the demonstration of faith. All right. So there's an, an, a demonstration within the space of 24 hours. 
And then in verse 22, and we're coming to it in just a moment, it gives the explanation of faith. All right, so let me run through it again. There's three areas. Number one, there is the declaration of faith. Number two, there is the demonstration of faith. And now comes the explanation of faith. Now, I don't know about you, but I'm interested in this explanation. Because if I know how to make this work, I can also give faith commands and see demonstrations of my faith at work. How many of you know what we're talking about? All right. And uh, so uh, in verse 22, Jesus is now getting ready to explain what just took place. You know, sometimes we start with the explanation, and then we move on to the proclamation, and then we have the demonstration, but Jesus had the proclamation first, then he, they had the demonstration, it happened before their very eyes, and then he gave the explanation. And here it is, verse 22, Jesus answered and he said to them, have faith in God. For assuredly, I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be removed and be cast into the sea, and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that those things he says will be done, he will have whatever he says. Now, I personally do not believe that Jesus was speaking or was telling us to speak to physical mountains and see them removed. You know, like Mount Cook, move from the South Island to the North Island. You know, Mount Ruapehu, move from the middle of the island over to the other side. I don't believe that that's what Jesus was talking about at all. But I do believe that we have mountains in our lives. Mountains are obstacles. Mountains can be problems, can be challenges that we are facing. You know, I used to live on Mount Ruapai. In fact, I used to live next to Mount Cook there, Pastor Vanessa and I did, uh, way back when we were still on the mainland and, and the South Island. But whichever way you turn, the mountain is always there. <laughs> okay, you get up in the morning, the mountain is there. Um, and then you turn around and you look at the mountain is there. And some people, it's like that with their problems. Whichever way they turn, their problem's right there. It just doesn't, it just, it's just there. It just doesn't go away. And some of these mountains, are the physical mountains, they are immovable. And sometimes certain mountains in people's lives, certain problems are, seem to be immovable. But they're not immovable. You can speak to them. You can identify what that mountain is and begin to address it with the words of your own mouth. Um, and uh, if you think about it, we're used to speaking to people, and that's kind of normal. You know, we use words to communicate, but speaking to things is probably a little unusual, but not entirely. I find myself, when I do something, I fiddle around with someone, like, come on, you know, you know, if I try to, whatever, I say, come on, you know, I start speaking to it. Uh, and we just need to develop that a bit more and be much more intentional about speaking to problems, speaking to obstacles, uh, situations in our lives. All right. So when Jesus said in verse 22, he says, have faith in God. We need to realize that some translations of the New Testament actually translate it differently. Uh, for example, in the Worrell's New Testament, um, and a few other translations, and also in the footnote of the King James Version, it actually translates it this way, that Jesus was saying, have the faith of God. Not just have faith in God, he said, have the faith of God. Now, have you noticed know these two things are two different things? Of course we have faith in God. We are, we are Christians. We are believers. We have faith in God. But you know what? You can, have faith, you can have faith in God and not necessarily have the faith of God and know what to do with it. All right? And what we're discussing here is to learn how to use the faith of God and use it in the same way as God uses faith to uh, when God created the heavens and the earth, He spoke words. He spoke faith-filled words. And that's how he created the world and everything in it. All right? So have the faith of God. So again, just to go over it, because this is very important. If you miss this point, uh, you're not going to fully get a hold of the revelation. Don't just have faith in God, but have the faith of God. Use faith and operate with it in the same way as God does. Uh, well, how did God create the heavens and the earth? And all the stars and, and everything. Well, God spoke. God actually spoke faith-filled words. P. 
people sometimes, and I've said this before, but it, it's important. Uh, people say, oh, you know, I just, I just did this by blind faith, or I stepped out in blind faith. Friends, there's no such thing as blind faith. Faith sees and faith knows. God knew exactly what he had in mind when he created the heavens and the earth, and when he spoke words, it all began to happen. When God created human beings, he knew exactly what he had in mind and who he had in mind, and God wasn't like surprised what the results were. God had a vision in his heart, and God spoke words, and then it, it began to exactly happen as God said. So realize it or not, but God created the heavens and the earth and everything that is in it by faith, by speaking faithful words. And you and I, we create our own world and everything that's in it largely by the words that we speak. You know what? That's both exciting and scary. It's scary if you have a loose mouth. And it's exciting if you can put a reins on your own mouth and begin to get very, very purposeful about it. You will create a better life for yourself if you put a restraint on your mouth. Because you see, Proverbs uh, um, chapter, is it chapter 18, verse 21, or chapter 21, verse 18, uh, 18, 21, it says, death and life, death and life are in the power of the tongue. Death and life. Yes, people have, you know, killed others with, you know, with their hands and with guns and what have you. But the Bible teaches us that we can kill with the words of our own mouth. And we say we're not just talking about physically killing people, but, you know, people's opportunities have been killed with the words of their own mouth. They go, I could never do that. Uh, people say, I could never afford that. Uh, well, they spoke death over their own situation. Inadvertently, they cursed themselves and held themselves back from coming into the fullness of what God has for them. Um, and uh, so it is very, very important that we lay a hold of the principle. And once we understand the principle, lay a hold of our tongue and no longer let it speak words of death. No longer let it speak words of doubt and unbelief. No longer let it speak words of sickness. No longer let it speak words of can't afford, but we begin to say the very opposite. We say what God says about us. We, we, we say that, you know, the Bible says we are fearfully and wonderfully made. All right? The Bible says we are blessed with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So we say exactly that. Uh, the Bible says that, uh, that we are blessed coming in and we are blessed going out. Uh, you know that all the blessings listed there in Deuteronomy chapter 28 and the first 13 verses absolutely applies to us. Because all the promises of God are yes and all the promises of God are amen in Christ. Once we're in Christ, Old Testament promises, New Testament promises all belong to us. All right? Um, and so um, we have the faith of God. And um, we use faith, um, we speak faith, and we create our own world. You know, was it Charles Capps that wrote a book and he talked about authority in three worlds. Authority in heaven, authority on the earth, and authority under the earth, or whatever the exact details were there. But he talked about a word system. God created the, the whole universe based on a word system. Words that are spoken, words that have been spoken, words that still need to be spoken. And that we rule and reign in life by the words that we speak. We can give away rulership by the words we speak, and we can lay a hold of authority by the words that we speak. So in verse 23, Jesus continues to talk about, first of all, he says, he says, all right, he says, have the faith of God. And then in verse 23, he says, whoever says to this mountain, have the faith of God, whoever says. Faith says. Whoever says. And uh, so what that means is as we examine verse 23, we notice that the word believe is only mentioned once, but the word speak is mentioned three times. 
And I remember in the teachings of Kenneth Hagin, he used to point that out. Now, this might not be a highly theological argument in terms of the exegesis of, of, the, of the Word of God, but nonetheless, there's a real point here that a lot of people don't realize and have missed, um, that the word believe is only spoken once. The word saying is mentioned three times. And friends, the reality is this that many people who try to walk by faith, they're not so much lacking in the believing department, but they're certainly lacking in the speaking department. They're not speaking faith-filled words, not consistently enough, not, um, not frequently enough, or they speak words contrary to faith. And of course, the book of James speaks about that, where he says, uh, he says that our tongue is like an unruly member. It is like the rudder of a ship. And of course, the rudder of the ship turns the ship left or right or steers it straight. And with your mouth, you can steer your own life straight or you can go this way or you can go that way. It's all to do with the words that we speak. James says we put bits in the horse's mouth. And we turn the horse this way, and we can turn the horse that way. And friend, you can turn the horse of your own life in any direction you want to. And it's done by the words that you speak. All right? So how's your speaking department? <laughs> All right, we're believers, you know, we are believers. We're doing, we're doing usually quite good in the believing department, but what stuffs people up is the speaking department. They don't understand, or they speak life and death, a bit of this, a bit of that. James explaining that whole situation, and one day we will get to that scripture. We've referred to it several times, but he says it's a little bit like even nature teaches us that a spring you know, that brings forth water. It either brings forth fresh water that you can drink or it brings forth bitter water that is poisonous that you can't drink. But there's no spring that brings forth a bit of this and a bit of that. Yet our mouth is able and capable of bringing forth both. It can bring forth life, death. It can bring forth blessing. It can bring forth cursing. And of course, the whole point is that we train ourselves to only speak life. And sometimes particularly moments of great temptation, it is better to not say anything at all than to say the wrong thing. Now, not saying anything at all does not necessarily fix anything. We need to speak and we need to speak life. But if you really come under pressure and it's about to pop out, it is better to bite your tongue and not say a single word because uh, once the word is out, uh, the devil will use it against you and those words will go forth and they will create. See, words are like little containers that we release and we speak into the atmosphere. We speak into situations. Um, and, uh, and they carry faith. And that faith will do something. And that faith will work in the positive and it will also work in the negative. Everybody all right this morning? Okay. So how are you getting on in the speaking department? <laughs> what have you said lately? <sighs> Second Corinthians chapter 4, verse 13. And since we have the same spirit of faith, according to what is written, I believed and therefore I spoke. We also believe and therefore speak. We also believe. You see, Paul the Apostle, teaching about faith, he's quoting from a verse of Scripture, always, that I'm, uh, I'm not entirely certain, but I think it might be uh, Psalm 51, where the psalmist says, you know, we, we believed and therefore we spoke. And then Paul says, he says, guess what? He says, we also believe we have the same spirit of faith. We believe and therefore we speak. So believing means speaking. And if we understand the process, we can be very precise and very purposeful about it. Friend, faith isn't silent. There's no such thing as silent faith. Faith constantly speaks what it believes. There's one thing that I'm aware of that in, in, in much of our 
prayer in our prayer meetings, whether that's Sunday morning pre-service prayer, or whether we do a lot of declaration because we understand the, the process. We don't, do no, we don't do no begging. We don't beg. We, we, we don't grovel before God. We realize that God's given us authority. And quite a bit of our prayer time, we declare things. We declare revival over our nation. We declare open hearts and open minds. We declare that the preaching of the gospel goes on. That preachers are bold everywhere. And rather than sort of fluffing around and trying to flower things up and everything, speak the word, the pure, unadulterated word of God. That will bring forth the results. Because ultimately, God's really only blessed his word when you think about it. God's, God's word is, is blessed. God doesn't necessarily bless your words or you endeavors or my endeavors. God's blessed his word. God's blessed his plan. When we get with it, that's where the blessings flow. <laughs> so faith isn't silent. And if we get with somebody and hang a little recorder around their head, around their neck, and let them speak, let them run through an, through an average day and record every word that they say throughout the whole day. And then sit down in the evening and take the recording off of them and say, okay, let's transcribe it now. And let's have a look what this person has been saying. You, you will be amazed that the average Joe Bloggs, average person definitely speaks more death than life, Definitely speaks more, you know, accident and calamity rather than speaking God's protection, speaking more lack and, and, and can't afford rather than God's provision. As I say, you will find that. And even amongst Christians, it is not uncommon where, you know, say, even people might get around the Gospels and they say, wow, wasn't it amazing when Jesus was around? Look at all the miracles and say, oh, wouldn't it be great if we could be around, could have been around when Jesus was around. No, friend, we are in a much better position today. Because Jesus was physically locked into one place at, in one time and in one location. Now the, the omnipresence of God is everywhere. The Spirit of God is everywhere. The revelation that we have today, the benefit of being able to look back into the Old Testament and read about it and learn faith lessons, the benefit of reading the New Testament and, and reading all the faith lessons there. We have much more understanding today. We just have to put it into practice and we have the same anointing in our lives the same authority that Jesus has had and that he's given to us even in the very great commission when Jesus uh, appeared to his disciples before he finally went to heaven after his you know death burial and resurrection and he says all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth and under the earth and he says you go therefore and make disciples he says cast out devils heal the sick cleanse the lepers raise the dead so hebrews chapter 13 verse 5 and 6 says for he himself has said I will never leave you nor forsake you. So we may boldly say, everybody say boldly say. Boldly. Okay, we don't say these things timidly, we say it boldly. All right, we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear what can man do to me. So what's happened here is that Jesus says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So we then kind of take that truth. We might even formulate it into our words and we boldly say, the Lord is our helper. We're not helpless. The Lord is our helper. I will not fear. I will not fear what tomorrow will bring. <laughs> what can man do to me? So this is the deal when we hear the word of God and believe it in our heart, we boldly say what the word of God says. When Jesus spoke to the fig tree, he made a very bold statement. As I said before, he wasn't vague. He wasn't hazy about it. He wasn't kind of like, oh, you know, he was just very definite about it. And friend, when you speak over your family, you speak over your finances, you speak over your career, 
release a bold blessing over it in Jesus' name. Be very clear and be very precise and be very bold. Take the Word of God, personalize it, and begin to speak it over your life in a consistent sort of a way. And in verse 23, Mark 11, Jesus still speaking, he says, Whoever says and does not doubt, but believes those things he says, he will have whatever he says. Now, in this instance here, I've taken out some of the Verse, some of the words in there to kind of simplify things. We're not changing the word of God. We're simply uh, kind of breaking things down so we can get our head around what Jesus really is trying to tell us. And here's the deal. What Jesus is really saying is you can have what you say or you will have what you say. Let me read it again. Whoever says... Uh, who, who is Whoever. Who is whoever? Well, anybody that wants to make this work for themselves, they can lay a hold of these things. Because people might otherwise say, oh, you know, Jesus can do that, but Jesus says whoever can do that. If you, if you think you might be a whoever, you can raise up your hand and say, well, I'm a whoever too. I can make this work for myself. I'm definitely a whoever. <laughs> All right? <laughs> whoever says and does not doubt but believes. You know, last week we talked about the fact that Sarah initially doubted, but she stayed with the program and eventually believed. And you know, sometimes we, we might start out in doubt, but that's okay. We keep going. We move out of doubt into faith. He says, but believes those things he says, he will have whatever he says. I say certain things in my life that... Uh, I'm believing more now than what I did 30 years ago when we started uh, in the ministry here. And uh, for that matter, 40 years ago when we got saved and when we began to learn some of these things and when we first picked up the Word. You know, we, we have faith in God, but we always didn't have faith in regards to every single promise. But when we developed faith regarding the promises of God, things really begin to happen. You know, somebody referred to it earlier on, but Don Gossett wrote a book entitled, What You Say Is What You Get. Of course, Don Gossett was a good friend of this house, good friend of Pastor Vanessa's and mine and his lovely wife, Deborah. Uh, Don went to heaven some years ago, but Deborah is still around, uh, still you know, still the writings of Don Gossett are still around. And one of his, uh, uh, he wrote a lot of fantastic books. And gosh, what a prolific writer. Wrote way over 100 books. And a lot of them are written around the whole area of praise and written around the concept of speaking faithful words. And that specific book that he wrote was called What You Say Is What You Get. And in many respects, in terms of, uh, of who we are as a people and what our church was built on, it was built on this understanding is what you say is what you get. Don also wrote a book entitled Confession Brings Possession. And he was just a master at crafting words and putting words together um, almost in a poetic sort of a way and with an understanding that, you know, snippets, phrases that we can, we can lay a hold of and, and grasp and say, all right, confession brings possession. If I see something in the Word of God and I see a promise that I want, confession will bring possession. And confession... You know, there's different words for the same thing, and depending on different people's backgrounds and, you know, church background and history and what have you, people either use the word confession or they use the word proclamation or they use the word affirmation or the word of declaration. It's all the same thing. It's just we were brought up with the word confession because that's what Brother Hagin used to teach us. And, you know, once you get away from the idea that confession is only about confessing of sins that you hold, every, all the words you speak is your confession. If you understand that, then, you know, your confession will bring possession. For that matter, your confession can also hinder you from possessing if you speak the opposite of what God speaks about you. 
So this book called What You Say is What You Get is built in its entirety on the very concept that Jesus is teaching us here in Mark 11, verse 23, verse 24. Have the faith of God. Whoever says to this mountain, be removed and be cast into the sea and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that those things which he says will come to pass, he will have whatever he says. Amazing. Brother Hagen was on his deathbed at age 16 with three incurable diseases, each one sufficient that would have killed him off, uh, all of their own, and yet he had three of them. And he was reading his grandmother's old Methodist Bible, and he got to Mark 11, 23, and he got the revelation that whoever can do this. People have said, oh, Jesus did this, and only Jesus can do that. But he had the revelation, oh, whoever can do this. And he figured out that he was a whoever. And he began to speak, and he received when he prayed and so forth. And uh, what an amazing story. So again, when we see something in God's Word, and we want to possess it, you have to confess it. You have to declare it. Habitually train yourself to habitually, consistently speak the Word of God over your life. I've said this before, but if you see me drive down the road, um, and you've got to look fast, because if you don't look fast, I've been and gone. I tell you, I do not believe in wasting time on the road, but that's a whole lot of matter. That's a whole lot of matter. But if you only see me sitting in the car, my mouth is moving, I'm either praying in tongues or I'm speaking the word. Because, you know, you, you, you don't just, uh, you know, it's great to have sort of slots throughout the day where I say, oh, I'm going to do my affirmations now. It's wonderful. It's great to do that. In fact, we have a whole book here that uh, Pastor Vanessa has put together called The Victory Program. It's available out there in the foyer. only costs you $10. It'll absolutely change your life if you haven't understood this uh, concept and this truth before. Grab yourself a copy before you go home today. And if you already got one at home, dust the, you know, get the, the dust off of it and bring it back out again and lay a hold of it this week. Because I'm saying, I'm saying, people don't have a problem so much in the believing department. They got a problem in the speaking department. That will train you to speak the word and to train you to put the word in. And once the word is in, you don't necessarily need a page in front of you. you you're able to speak the word of, out of your heart. In fact, that really brings me to the second point and the last point in this message here today. I want to speak to you about the confession of faith versus the confession unto faith. Confession of faith is opposed to confession unto faith. Again, Kenneth Hagin used to teach that and subsequent generations of, uh, of you know, faith preachers and people that have absolutely blessed our lives and we still preach it today um, because we know what it's done for us and this understanding if put into practice it'll make a radical difference uh, in our lives and in our families in our careers in our businesses and just all around Kenneth Hagin used to teach that there are two types two different types of confessions of the word of God the first one is uh, the confession of faith we, we, we've just discussed before. Jesus made a confession of faith against the fig tree, and within 24 hours, he had a result. All right? But the second type of the confession, and this is the preparatory confession, we call it the confession unto faith. Or in other words, when we first start confessing the word, we, we are putting faith in and to faith. You see, the Bible says that faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. Romans chapter 10, verse 17. When you speak the Word, you personalize it, begin to speak the Word, the promises of God. Speak what God says about you. Your spirit hears it. It comes out of your own mouth, but your own ears hear it. And it transfers down into your spirit. Your spirit hears it and eventually lays a hold of it. Faith comes. You don't need to wait for somebody to preach the word of God to you. You can preach the word to yourself. You, you, become, the own, you become your own prophet in your own life. You prophesy your own future. 
You begin to declare the blessing and the promises of God. And you know how wonderful it is for us to have ministers in our lives that are enriching our lives with the teaching and the preaching of the word. But ultimately, you are the best prophet of your own life. You are the best preacher. Preach to yourself. <laughs> sometimes, you know, sometimes people say, oh, I'm not sure what this one is preaching. I don't know if I can believe it. But you ought to believe what you preach to yourself. This is the problem. You see, where people speak life and death and people lie, cheat, and steal and what have you, then they don't believe what they speak out of their own mouth. You become a person of honesty and of truth and of integrity. And when you speak, you lay great weight on it. And that's the whole deal. When you speak the Word of God, you hear it with your ears, and it registers in your spirit. And once your spirit's got a hold of it, you have faith. And now you're ready for the confession of of faith. And that's when you have demonstration. Jesus was, as I said earlier on, was highly developed in his faith, absolutely highly developed in his faith. He is a man of prayer. He is a man of the word. And uh, when he spoke, things really, really happened. But again, our initial attempts of declaring the word of God uh, to put faith into our hearts before the confession unto faith turns into a confession of faith. So many times tell the story when Pastor Vanessa and I were in Bible college. Um, and we had about, we lived in the city there in Wellington. We had about a 15-minute drive in the morning to get, uh, we were already living in the central city and the Bible college was in the central city. We just have to move from one side of town into the, into the uh, out uh, edge there, and uh, I was driving. We had bundled the kids together and already put them in the car, and, uh, and as we left, we said, all right, uh, bring out the Word. And Pastor Vanessa would open up the Bible, and she would turn to Deuteronomy chapter 28, start out in verse 1, and read all the way through to verse 13. These are all the blessings. It's of course, not the only place where blessings are listed, but it's a good one. It's a good place. We began to declare that we were blessed in the city and we were blessed in the field, that we were blessed coming in and blessed going out, that our basket was blessed, our storehouse was blessed, the fruit of our body, our children were blessed, our descendants are blessed. And we began to speak that just consistently, consistently, every morning, every morning, every morning. And then I suppose throughout the day, but that was kind of confession time. You know, we just, uh, we just got three of our, our grandbabies at our house uh, at the moment uh, because the parents are away. And gosh, you forget how busy it gets with little kids in the house, three of them. And, uh, but it's amazing. We had four at that time, and we still confessed the word. We're still consistent about it. So to take a hold of your life. Be, be purposeful. And begin to confess the word and build faith into your heart. You know, when you listen to the preaching of a, of a, of a message that raises your faith level, you, you understand that, but you can preach to yourself and raise your own faith level. Speak the word. Be bold about it. So again, once we have faith in our heart concerning any promise from God, our confession becomes a confession of faith. Up to now, it's been a confession unto faith, but then it becomes a confession of faith. And friend, bold declarations of faith lead to demonstrations of faith. And just as we're getting ready to wind down, we've got the children ready to come and bring their presentation, which is going to be absolutely wonderful. I encourage you today, focus this week on confessing God's word more consistently and more boldly than you've ever done before. It'll make a difference in your life. So say, with the four areas of walking by faith, number one, hear the word, number two, believe the word, number three, confess the word, and number four, do the word. Let's really focus on number three this week and really, really, really boldly confess the word consistently. If you need the victory program, grab one on the way out. Otherwise, if you've got your own uh, confession sheets, bring them out again. Uh, I still remember the Don Gossett and his never again list that we almost learned off by heart. Never again will I confess 
confess lack. Never again will I confess sickness or disease. Never again will I confess. Uh, just wean ourselves off of this other stuff and only speak life. God bless you. Let the children come and do what they do so well. Come on, kids. We're ready for you.